Hi everyone, Raphael Harry here, and you're listening to White Label American, a podcast where we hear stories from an immigrant or two, sometimes more. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of White Label American. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Before we begin, I would love to give a shout out to my patrons. Thank you for your support always. And to everyone listening, you can also join them and become a patron on on Patreon by either going to patreon.com slash white label American pod or go on linktree slash white label American and you see all our links over there. And we also have t-shirts available on vet clothing dot com so you'll be supporting also a brother and a veteran so yeah go out there and support small businesses black businesses veteran owned businesses and yeah pick your color of t-shirt and all that and yeah keep the love coming in go on um, apple podcast or itunes and give us five stars it's the right thing to do so don't fail with that you can do that as many times as possible and uh, write a positive review also it helps us grow an independent podcast so with that being said let's jump to the very special person i have in the studio today well virtually but um yeah she's still in the studio so i have the honor of having susan presida who is our guest today miss presida she's an engineer she's a content creator she's a super mom she's an all-around uh motivational person on the social medias because um, it's not only just about making content or being an engineer. She also talks about things that she, she embraces her, huma- her womanness, she embraces her humanity, and she gives you shame-free femininity. And you, you just have to follow this woman and you see why I brought her here. But we're going to dive into all that. And with that being said, welcome to White Label American. How are you doing today? Thank you. I am doing great. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to you. Hey, I'm I'm over excited to talk to you too because <laughs> there's so many beautiful things I know you're gonna drop with us today. So let's begin at the very beginning. You have a very you have beautiful names, but there's one name that stands out the most, Priscilla. What, what what what? Can you give us the origin of the name, the meaning? Yes. Yeah. So my name um, originally comes from Sanskrit. I was born in India, so Sanskrit, of course, is our uh, root language there, one of them. Um, And so it means pleasant. My name actually means pleasant in Sanskrit. And I'm really lucky that I'm not a mean person. Otherwise, it'd be a funny name for me. Yeah, we would would have had to ask for a (laughs) refund or something. Yeah. Even though I'm not the one who gave you the name, but I'm still (laughs) saying that. That would have been, yeah. (laughs) I would have to stuck with the middle name. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow yeah that, that, that that's yeah that the name the name suits you it, it yeah thank you yeah it works it works i think i'm pretty pleasant for yeah. the most part unless you make me mad yeah, well that, <laughs> for that that is that is the right way to go and I, in my opinion that's the i see nothing wrong with that i, I try yeah. to be as pleasant as i can yeah, yeah. But just don't cross that bridge you know don't don't force me to cross the setting bridge. Right. yeah that that's how i say it. but yeah that's beautiful that's beautiful so um yeah, it, it it explains why. Yeah, you right from the first time I communicated with you, it was all you. You were very pleasant. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the name suits you one hundred percent. So, thank yeah. you. And uh, where can you also let us know where you were born and what your childhood was like? Sure. So I was born in Mumbai, India, and I lived there until I was about five, and then I moved from Mumbai to Houston. Um, and I, I was there for a few years, and then I moved to Oklahoma City. And if you've ever been to Houston, you know that it's really not too far off from India because there's a huge Desi population there, a very big Indian population in Texas as a whole. Um, but Oklahoma was definitely a culture shock. There's not a lot of diversity. Well, there wasn't at the time. It's much better now. Um, but growing up for me was, I think, probably very typical in the sense of being an immigrant because you know, you go to school and you're American kind of, but not really because you're an immigrant. And then you go home and you're in the cultural activities and, you know, the, we have our own celebrations and, you know, the things that we just do for culture and you're Indian, but not really because you're kind of American. So 
<laughs> definitely a subculture I grew up wearing a lot of Indian clothes I remember show and tell I like wore an Indian outfit to school any chance any excuse I could get to wear Indian clothes or wear like my bindi my um like on, on my forehead yeah. I would wear it any of my bangles anything that I could wear that represented my culture I wore it shamelessly and my parents they never made me feel bad for doing it so oh, wow that's that's yeah. good that yeah that's good I, I've basically grown up here so yeah, yesterday was uh, I, I've been to Houston once. Um, I, actually, I spent two days there, and yeah, it's quite a huge place. So I was like, man, this this not for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, way too huge. I had to be driving everywhere. I was like, ah, like I was I was preparing it to is. move to New York, and um, yesterday I was playing on Instagram and I came across this AJ Plus story that talked about uh, the journalist who covered who did the, pre the presentation was um, in Houston and he was like, wow, there's so many Pakistanis in Houston. And uh, it kind of um, expanded into the whole ABCD, uh, the, De the Desis. Yeah. And then, but he, he was, his focus was mostly on Pakistanis and then like, you know, how life has been like for them after 9-11. And then um, um, the person who was giving him the tour around um, talked about, uh, um, after Trump, it was, she had to take off her hijab because she she mm -hmm. um, she always went to houses, individual houses for her job. So yeah, it, she didn't feel safe anymore. And the yeah. comments were interesting that I was reading, and but I was like, oh, that's a uh, whole. So it's called uh, Sugarland. Uh, I, I, I was like, wow, Sugarland. Uh, that's that's is that the name for Houston, or is that just the area <laughs> that has the large Desi population? And I was like, wow, that, that was quite eye-opening. And there were some things that was speaking out, too, that I was like, huh. Yeah, it, it was towards the end I saw a black person. I was like, okay, because it was like, love diversity. Yeah, I love that. I was like, oh, let's see white people. I don't know, I'm not yeah. seeing the black or Latinos mixing because there's like a popular Pakistani restaurants that um, they were talking about. So I guess the day they were filming, maybe a lot of black people were not eating there. So I was like, yeah, let me not jump to conclusions like that. So, but it was quite eye-opening for me to see that because um houston i i consider houston as one of the as probably nigeria's headquarters in the united states because mm. mm -hmm. there's so many damn nigerians there god damn <laughs> there's so many so many i don't know how many of my classmates from high school and junior secondary are over there um the people from my navy days who are there and i'm like no 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 and even the first time i met a woman from houston and I try to, you know, I was, I was, it was a few years back when I was still, you know, a little bit more toxic than I am now. <laughs> and, you know, I try to be on, a friend called me and I was speaking in our, our Creole to, hey man, I got a girl here. And I, you know, get, get off, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah. like, well, I, I, I was like, oh, I got a very hot babe. That's, I was telling him all that in our language, uh, not our language, but our Creole, which is uh -huh. like the, uh -huh. the broken English that we speak. And... When I was done, she was like, oh, yeah, I understood everything you were saying, by the way. But thanks for complimenting my, my, my looks. <laughs> and I was like, w w w what do you mean? Where are you from? And she's like, oh, I'm from, I'm from Houston. I grew up around Nigeria. I said, like, oh, man, this is not going to be where well, yeah, this is. Uh, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, we need a new code book for this one. We need Morse, Morse code or something. <laughs> so that, that's when I started realizing how... Uh, Nigeria and Houston was, but I think I never considered other people making Houston a home yeah. or being a large community there until I once came across an article about the Vietnamese immigrants that were brought here and a lot of them settled in the Houston area. And then uh, when, uh, what's his name, uh, Prime Minister Modi visited and Hassan mm -hmm. Minaj went to cover the, the event at the stadium in Houston, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, this yeah. is this, oh man, I, okay, okay, yeah, good thing I did not go there and then say the wrong yeah. thing. Like the India mafia might attack me, or Pakistani <laughs> mafia might attack me. I'm like, man, they got too much going on in Houston. Yep, I'm better off in New York. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I, I, from what I hear, New York might not be all. They probably have their own mafia too. Oh, so. we, everybody does. Everybody does. But. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot easier for me to be like, yeah, I got my own mafia too. Like, uh, <laughs> I got no. As long my, as you my, have your own. My, my, my daughter is the, the mafia, but uh, yeah, <laughs> she, yeah, she she's the one who 
we, we, we don't we don't talk about that. I, I still pretend to be a dictator. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, back to you. Um, where would you consider your favorite childhood memory to be from? Houston okay. or Oklahoma City or back in Mumbai? My favorite childhood memory memory is going back to India. Honestly, when I was living in Oklahoma City, so I was probably around nine years old, mm -hmm. and at that point, it had been a few years coming here. Um, you know, since immigrating, and I stayed the whole summer in Mumbai. I remember going, and none of my family immigrated over. You know, typically there's some chain migration, but my family didn't come. They all oh. chose to stay in India because they wanted the food and the culture and, okay. you know, just the Indian experience. And this is also around the time when things were shifting over to India. So it was just nice to go back and, you know, be with my grandparents and my uncles and aunts and just to be around all my family. And I, I don't know Hindi, but I'm South Indian, so I know Malayalam, but I, I remember learning. Oh, I never Hindi heard that before. Time. Yeah, it's South Indian, um, kind of similar to Tamil, but okay. I, it was just nice. Yeah, it was just very, very nice. That's honestly probably my favorite childhood memory coming back. I remember when I came back, people were telling me, oh, you sound so Indian. I had like a strong Indian accent when I came <laughs> back. I think I, I learned my first cuss word when I was there with my cousins, oh. my first English cuss word. So, it was just... <laughs> so, so what, what did you and your cousins used to do while you were over there? You know, what's funny, it was we used to play, and I'm not being funny, but I'm being serious. We used to play Cowboys and Indians. Ah, that's not, that's <laughs> not, that's not a surprise. That, well, I, I played Cowboy and Indians. And yeah, we have, the, the only bad side of it was that we, we all, the Indians were supposed to be the bad guys. Yeah. And that, because that, those were the images we were giving. And yes. so all the kids started playing that. We played um, Cops and Thieves. And yes. didn't realize the programming that we we're getting ourselves. Yes. Into. <laughs> it's the same but, thing. We would play the same things running yeah. around the house, things mm -hmm. like that. And then you know, Mumbai is pretty big. It's like New York, you know. So we had, um, I remember there was like a, a, a guy outside of the balcony window and he had his own, like a small little Ferris wheel. Kind of oh, like okay. at a fair. Yeah. So he knew, he knew whenever he was there that I was going to stick my head up, you know, from the balcony and I would look down. I would go ask my Amachi, my grandmother, for some money. <laughs> and me and my cousin would go down there and buy this every day. So. Wow. That's a, a smart, smart business move there. Very smart business move. <laughs> Targeting the flat with all the children. So, um, one thing I've known from the Indian uh, subcontinent is, um, uh, it, and it exists outside of that area. It exists all over the world, to be honest. But I think one in India is like a lot more popular, uh, more common. I would say it's become more commonly associated with India is the the caste system. And were you in any way affected by that, or did that uh, apply to you? Because I know you you're from a Christian family, so I don't know. I, yeah. I, I don't think I've ever asked anybody from a Christian family about that. Yeah, it applied indirectly. So my dad actually was Hindu and he converted to Christianity and he was a high caste Indian family. Um, so when he converted, it was a big deal. He was kind of kicked out of his family and went to live with friends. This is when he was 16. Oh, wow. Um, and That's he, pretty he early. Just, yeah. Yeah. So he was, you know, kind of excommunicated from his family for a long time um, and then found some Christian people to take him in and went to theological seminary and school and things like that. So it affected me indirectly. I didn't experience it directly, but I know just from watching my parents that it was a long time before my dad went back and talked to his family. It was, you know, years before they were willing to have that conversation with him just because his conversion was very spoiling for the family name and for the family mm. cast. So. Mm. Wow. Wow. So do, do you feel that, um, that may have played a role in any of your first interactions with black people after moving to the United States? For me, honestly, when I first started interacting with black people, I didn't recognize the difference because mm -hmm. my family is South Indian. So my family has dark skin. They have curly hair. You know, we have mm -hmm. like, if I look at like Indian people have the typical images like this thin, narrow nose. We don't have that nose. We have like a broader nose. So when I met people here who were black, I very much associated them as family. So I would see black people and I'm like, oh, you know, you're like closer to me than anyone else. Mm -hmm. So I always felt warm and comfortable and uh, much more at home around anyone who was black than 
then I didn't, you know, I never felt like I was an outsider. It felt like family. And then I had, you know, we had pictures of family back in India and I'm looking at them, my uncles, my cousins, they're dark. They're like super dark. So I just, I didn't see that there was really a difference until I got much older. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it, it's good that you, you already had that exposure. Um, like for Bollywood is huge in Nigeria. Growing up, it was yes. mad, huge <laughs> until we, uh, some of us gained what I consider um, TV independence with access yeah. to illegal cable and <laughs> yeah. um, other things. And that's how we were able to break free from, from the whole house watching Bollywood and being yeah. like, oh, Bollywood is for all the women kind of thing. But now almost all my dudes who I know still are crazy about Bollywood, you know? And, yeah, uh, it's a musical. It, it, yeah, it used to be Fridays, Friday nights. Before we had private TVs, every Friday night was both state and federal TV was Bollywood movie. That was what they wow. uh, wrapped up with. So we had a whole lot of, Bollywood has always had a large influence on, um, on the Nigerian entertainment space. But in doing that, at the same time, it may have also created the... Uh, wrong image to an extent because we all assume oh all indians look like this all indians yes. are like this and everybody from that part of the world is supposed to be light-skinned and all that yeah. and then i get stationed in um back rain and that's when i met an indian who was either darker than i am or yeah as dark as i was and i was but the hair texture was different i was, I was like Man, what, what is, where are you from, man? Are you from Africa? Yeah. He's like, oh, no, I'm, I'm from India. I'm like, what? You got Indians like yeah. you? He's like, uh, yeah, which probably was offensive for me to be asking that. But I was so shocked, you know? And, but I, I knew his wife because his wife was um, one of the lecturers at my, um, the Navy college. They, they, they could give uh, cl college classes to sailors. So I got to know the wife and, and I was like, damn, you. You're light skin and your husband is dark like this. Like what? Mm -hmm. And so I was that was just mind blown to me. Like I'm yeah. seeing it in person. And then over the years I've seen articles and I've read more stuff and I'm like, wow. So a lot of dark skinned Indians, but you know, you watch a whole bunch of Hollywood no, no uh, Bollywood movies, we don't see that. And right. even there's um an Indian woman who well, she she was raised in Nigeria, but we have we have people like that who born it's i think it, she might she may have been born in nigeria i don't recall but i can't recall but she grew up in nigeria and she made the um what the, the nollywood bollywood movie mm -hmm. some i forgot what she called it something love i don't like the movie the, uh, yeah but uh that movie also has that same one type of indians you're yeah. seeing you know and you like yeah so but well, is there diverse in the country and people just tend to like and then wait there's people of yeah, darker skin, like we just assumed you must be from Africa if you're automatically mm -hmm. darker skin. You must be living on the continent. And then, oh, those are the Indians who came to who, who came to Africa like 600 years ago or 400 years ago or 200, whatever years ago. And it was like, no, no, these are people who yeah. live on the continent, to the subcontinent, and were born and raised there. The generations yeah. have been there. And it's, yeah, it's, it's normal. They're, they're, they qualify. And it's like, wow. Yeah. Wow, we don't know. We don't know because we just... Yeah, so I, I think that's one thing that I have been doing away with trying to reprogram myself on when it comes to um, identifying and uh, uh, acknowledging people who are from mm -hmm. um, places like India and others. Because, yeah, I'm like, yeah, people probably look like me or, you know, yeah, just yes. the hair. And, you know, yep. Maybe if I'd seen them when I was younger, I probably would have tried to copy their hairstyle too. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, we are trying to copy a lot of white hairstyles and all that. Yeah, you know, that that's not the full reason for why I'm bald now, but you know, <laughs> well, I played a played a little part, little part. In that. <laughs> so, um, which you've been now in in uh, from Houston, you go to Oklahoma City, and your your family was okay with you embracing black people and black culture well how no. did that interaction go no absolutely not they no they weren't okay with it in any way i mean i grew up in a home where there was a lot of um anti-blackness mm -hmm. where you know you're kind of in the indian culture you're warned about oh you know if you go marry outside of your race here's what will happen but it was much worse to marry someone or to date someone i mean 
really marriage because we didn't really date in our culture. Oh, but yeah. Someone, <laughs> someone black versus someone white, we, you know. We, like, we have that in common. It's like, yeah, this you don't do the girlfriend, boyfriend. Oh, you're straight. No, Why are you married. getting married? Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah straight through marriage, yeah. So. But no, it, it wasn't, it wasn't welcome at all you know it was kind of confusing for me because like I said I grew up in a Christian home so to see a Christian home that just really disenfranchised black people and then to learn really racist things at church it just didn't make sense to me um, it never made sense to me as a kid I just like I said I saw anyone who had darker skin as very connected to me so it didn't it didn't um, resonate with me. And so my parents, I mean, like I said, growing up, I had a lot of black friends. So they were okay with it when it was friends, you know, it was okay yeah. when I had black friends that I wanted to hang out with. But then when it was people that I was, you know, dating or, you know, my parents catch me texting someone, whole nother story, mm. whole nother story, not welcome at all. I mean, my dad, they're not as extreme, you know, they didn't, send me away or you know send me to some boarding school but there was definitely serious conversations about my behavior and their worry for me and what they needed to do about it but I'm I just kind of did what I wanted to do anyway yeah <laughs> so. so you mentioned boarding school and I'd I like to just zero in on that because that's one thing that um another, that's another thing that we have in common from our communities and I know like a lot of Nigerian diaspora try to use the boarding school weapon as a threat when they like feel like, oh, you, you, this child is being way too Americanized. You know, you don't be, yeah. you, don't, you forgot him where you come, you don't know where you come from. I'm, I'm okay. Let's, well, you know, the nicer ones will even tell you that they're taking you to Nigeria, moving you into a boarding school in Nigeria. The non, the the typical ones that I'm aware of is that they just, oh, let's go on vacation. Where are we going? We're going to Nigeria. Okay. And you go, and next thing, you're, 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 um, uh, where, where's my dad? Where's my mom? Oh, they, they left. Like, what? Yeah, you, you go, they, they dumped you with an uncle and they go put you in a boarding school and yeah, you're going you go to learn the culture. That's the way, yeah, because you, you need that discipline. And there have been lots of, there have been some traumatic experiences from those. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, um, but we tend to celebrate just you know the people oh they made it so look at look at it. it's, a, it's a shiny this this works it's an example that this works to mm -hmm. maintain it and keep that uh, thing going on because even before my daughter before we had our um, our daughter uh, there were a few people who had mentioned that oh if your daughter steps out of line you go do that send her to Nigeria I'm like send her to the same people who didn't treat me well I'm gonna yeah. hand her over so. Yeah, so is that also a common thing in your experience among the community to like threaten kids or like send them over to boarding school it, across? I, I don't think it's as common for South Indians. I know okay. some North Indian friends who experience things like that, but in South Indian community, it was, I mean, the culture is so strong and there's so much pressure that I think that kept most people in line. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that went and did whatever they wanted, it was like, it just looked bad on the parents. But no, I mean, at worst case, they would have probably just sent me there for, you know, a summer again or something like that. Um, I ended up going to boarding school anyway on my on my own choice for high school. But that B was boarding school because, here. Yeah, it was in Oklahoma City. Okay. Uh, it was I graduated from the Oklahoma School of Science and Math and it was a boarding school. It was actually a good experience, though, because it was nice. my choice. Nice. Um, but yeah, yeah, from no, from the, from, from the, the title, I, I, it didn't sound like a um, Christian boarding school, which is a whole no. different thing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm glad that uh, you had a good experience there. I've had some. I've had a few people who've had good experiences with boarding schools back on the continent, and mm -hmm. I've had a few traumatic ones. Some refuse yeah. to. Some don't want to even go near them, and I, I get it. I get it. But yeah, it's boarding school. Is um, yeah, that, that, there needs to be a documentary on boarding schools yes. because that yeah. it's not. It's not. It, it, that to me, it, the history of how it started is yeah. It's very yeah. It's mad problematic it wasn't hmm. it wasn't for a good reason that they started budding schools but doesn't mean you can't make it good in the present yeah. because that, yeah. that's what i believe you can always turn something that people plan to use for something evil and make it positive i yeah. agree that's beautiful so uh before we continue because i want i want to dive into um you being in college because i know you had a whole great experience there and um you into your career um, we're going to take a quick break and we shall be right back with more juice for you all to enjoy. Hi everyone, 
we've made it two years and who would have thought so so let's go for that and make it three make it four make it five make it six who knows 20 but we can't do this without your support so join us on patreon at patreon.com slash white label american pod pod or linktree.com slash white label american go there and you'll see our patreon link and you can join us for as low as three dollars we have bonus content we have bonus materials there's so much juice over there that we don't release to the public and yeah you can contribute to making this podcast better you can send questions you can send your ideas and also there's a lot of new things that are coming the announcements are made on patreon first because we have to you know take care of people who help make this podcast possible so you can be the one to make this podcast what you want it to be come join us on patreon and make it what you would like to see join us make it fantastic keep the five stars coming in keep the love coming in thank you for the privilege of your company all right we're good awesome awesome okay so welcome back and thank you for staying with us so now let's dive in how did you know what you wanted to get into career wise was there any nudges or you know you can you can tell you can tell i ain't going i'm I'm not gonna tell nobody (laughs) but you know so yeah it it was pretty clear to me when i was about four years old that i was either going to be a doctor or engineer (laughs) oh wow (laughs) that that was what i was told to do i remember being i remember being five and coming to houston and my family and all of the culture around us telling me that i needed to go to rice university (laughs) So yeah, my mom is also a nurse um, and she, we, I kind of was raised in healthcare, which is pretty typical for Indians as well in our community. And Nigerians so, too. We, 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 there. We love, yeah. that, that's another similarity between us. Yes, definitely. <laughs> our communities is like, yeah. But I know in India for us, my mom was a nurse, not because she couldn't have intellectually been a doctor, but because mm-hmm. of the money. Yeah. So my mom always encouraged me, you know, don't be the nurse, go be the doctor. Mm. Um, and I, I actually went to school for medicine. And then as I was applying to med school, I just realized I had no passion. In it. I had worked in an emergency room for five years and I just, I didn't like it. There wasn't for me and I wasn't a fan. Um, I actually, it's one of the few things, you know, I listened to my parents, despite them thinking I don't, I did follow their advice <laughs> and I went back for engineering. Um, wow. I always liked math. So, I mean, for me, engineering, it's worked out really well. Um, I've been in, in it now for seven years. And it's actually very fulfilling, very, very fulfilling, even though there's really not a lot of women in it. There's yeah. not a lot of minorities in it, mm-hmm. but it's still, I mean, it's very rewarding. I get a chance to work with amazing people and be involved in the community. So it's nice. So uh, what type of engineering uh, did, um, are you um, focused on? I'm a mechanical engineer. Mechanical. That means that when I was in school, there was like, a thousand people and two of them were girls. Wow. And I was one of the two. So oh, oh. wait, so wait, um you, you you didn't go to Rice University, right? Nope. So I went you, to the University of Oklahoma. You you broke your parents' heart there. I did. And then I did. Universal so in the University of Oklahoma, what was that experience like being in a in a class where the only like two women and going through all that like did the professors even re- recognize that you are their students and that kind of, cuz i've had some oh. people's experiences with stuff like that and, and i'm like damn I, that, that's that's where i begin to see some privilege that i have like well, yeah you know you don't you don't as a dude i don't see something like that except when it comes to like the racial side of things but yeah i was like hey, that's a whole yeah i don't think i want to be like in the classroom like that no. Yeah. No, I mean, we, the, the few women, you know, we definitely stuck out because mm-hmm. we were the only women. Um, the, what was it like? It was good. I had to learn to deal with a lot more men that weren't like me because mm. when I was doing, well, I mean, when I was in school before, it was like, I was dealing with really diverse men and yeah. open minded men. And this was very like stereotypical patriarchal white men, you know, very, the stereotype yeah. of a white man in mm-hmm. America, you know, wasp. So it was hard for me because I'm I'm very liberal. I'm very sexually open. I'm very open-minded. And so having these conversations was challenging. It was, it was difficult to find sometimes people to work with, but it got easier. I mean, it got easier because I would just 
start focusing on the work, you know, and then if along the way I met a friend, that was fine, but I didn't care anymore. I just was like, well, I need to get the work done. And so I got to find some people to do the work with and hopefully we can connect. And if we can't, I'm still going to get the work done. Awesome. So um, another thing that you did while in university was joining a black uh, sorority. So did. did that also help make your university experience smoother? Amazing. There's a few things in life that absolutely have shaped me. One is definitely going to the boarding school, the Oklahoma School of Science and Math. Um, and the, another one is um, my ex-husband, the man that I had children with. And for sure, joining Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated has absolutely shaped my life. I mean, it made college what it was. I was so connected to amazing women that were supportive and loving and kind and open-minded and they could relate to what it was like to be a woman and a woman of color in these spaces and the challenges and i i honestly didn't realize how beautiful it was until i left college and i had to try to recreate that on my own hmm. and i didn't have you know just trying to find in the professional world in my industry it's hard to find women to begin with, much less women of color. So, I mean, I was so privileged. It was amazing. My experience at OU, I was very, very much immersed into black culture. I mean, I just, I just chose to follow my heart and that's where my heart le led me and best decision ever. My best friends now are absolutely my sorority sisters. And we just have such connection because we tend to be very similar as well. So it's just a beautiful heart and spirit connection that brings us together. Nice. See that that's um, one thing that I saw in my life as proof that I the anti-blackness in me was still um, strong because it was after I was done in the navy that I would go to college and yeah I didn't even want to think about it I, I was already really like oh, all sororities are like frat houses I, mm -hmm. that was like the impression that I had and then to look for a black sorority. Uh, yeah, I was like, well, wow, I won't be around black people. I've been around black people all my life. Like, you know, I, I need to go see the world. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, the world didn't really see me, like, you know. And then it's later on, uh, every time I come across someone like yourself who uh, was in a sorority, and it's, um, I'm, I can see the difference. I can see how um, someone like myself would have liked it. But yeah. I was like, yeah, you don't need to be around there, you know. And it was, it, but mine was tied more to anti-blackness, you know. I yeah. tried to admit that later on. Like, it, I tried to deny it for a long time. But it, it was that because the impressions you had, I had gotten before coming over here was, uh, you know, it's like, don't be around those people. Don't be around these yeah. people and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, we don't realize how that stuff works or how it, it starts to mess with our brain until... Um, you know, if you are lucky enough to catch it and say, oh man, I denied myself so many opportunities to enjoy school because mm -hmm. school for me was just go study, pass, study, pass. That, that's it. Not, yeah. Not even enjoy anything. <laughs> that was just yeah. it for me. <laughs> so I'm yeah. glad yours was, um, it was a great time. And uh, one thing you mentioned was uh, amongst the people and the things that have shaped you is your ex husband. I always love hearing you give flowers to this gentleman and I'm like, yeah, this, you, you guys are not together, but uh, every, every time it's like you speak about him, I can tell that there's, um, there's a love and admiration for the individual. And it's something that's beautiful to see because I'm not uh, the type who says everyone who gets married should stay together forever, but that doesn't mean you know, you, you can't be friends you, just because you, it, it, it didn't work out or you have to go separate ways. So um, how, how do you, you mind giving us a little juice on your ex-husband? Like, why is this guy so um, <laughs> inspirational from the way you talk about him in other platforms and other places I've seen you mention him? How is he, how did he have a, uh, an impact on your life, a positive impact on your life? Yeah, so I, I met him first when I was really young. I was 21. I think he was 19. I was getting ready to graduate OU the first time. Then we just immediately hit it off. But we spent basically our 20s together, you know, growing up and mm -hmm. growing together and figuring out who we were. And we got married a couple of years after meeting and we had three kids. We have two boys and a girl. And he's just been very inspiring to me because he endured a lot. I mean, he was like, grew up, you know, project baby, just single mom raising five kids by herself and mom got out of the projects you know made her way just really inspiring and he has that same 
fight in him. You know, he's mm. a really amazing father. He's very kind hearted. He's got a good spirit and it didn't work out for our marriage. You know, it just, it didn't. And I think we're way better as co-parents. We're, we're way more patient with each other. There's just a much better friendship, but the human that he is and the way that I've grown from being in his life and him being in mine. I mean, he just was very patient with me. I went through a lot of trauma in my childhood and he was very key in helping me work through that and processing it and just being very patient with me as a woman and as a mother and just enduring. You know, there was just a lot of times where where we both made mistakes, but just a lot more times where there was just love, you know, and that love, we both knew when the divorce happened that the love wasn't going to just mag magically disappear. It was just going to go into our kids. Yeah. Our relationship was just going to change and it wasn't going to be romantic. It was going to be a friendship. And so we've definitely maintained that. I mean, I, my, like I said, my, my family is still in India. So anything with my children is dependent on him. It's dependent on him and his family. And we have to get along and we have to co-parent and the children do better that way. You know, the children mm. do better when they see two parents, getting along and not fighting now that's not to say they haven't seen us get frustrated at each other they have but they've yeah. also seen us resolve it and grow so yeah i have a world of respect for him he continues to impress me in the way that he grows um yeah and and he can handle all of my fiery angry energy and, and helps me <laughs> calm it down so i mean i have to respect that so yeah, yeah i love that you, you you mentioned resolve and growth because um you know when, when i was probably 17 18 you know the, the world was like oh, I, i get married before i'm 23 24 have four kids you know consider if the <laughs> person i get married to one four kids but hey that was uh you know it just seemed like time was everything would just be straightforward get a house get a car or two cars you know one for the wife you know, it, it was a minivan so she can be taking the kids because obviously <laughs> i'm the one who deserves a sports car that kind of thing <laughs> and yep. By the time I was 26, I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, um, I don't even know if I want to have kids. It yeah. change because now we, we evolve as people. And, um, yeah, so the, the way I started looking at things like divorce and, you know, people um, going through relationships. And I think one of one thing that began to scare me was when I, someone would say, oh, I'm only in this marriage because of the kids. And I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I look back to my family and I'm like I can't point to one person who was in a happy relationship based on that reason. Yeah. So why would I want to be the same person doing similar or advise someone to be you know to do, repeat oh stay in it, just stay for the kids and stay for yeah, the but kids. you know it's but, it's guilt associated with mm -hmm. that, you know, because I went through the same thing when going through the divorce. It was like, well, you know, the kids need to see a home and they need to see that. And, you know, it's it makes me a bad parent if I get divorced. And then I actually had a friend tell me that. She said, I watched my parents, you know, stay together for us. And me and my brother wished that they had gotten divorced so they could have been happier. And they got a divorce, you know, after we left the house. And it just gave me a lot of freedom. To I, be able I appreciate to know. that friend because I wish many yeah. people would be honest like that you know I, I i try not to be found in rooms because i do clubhouse yeah. i try not to be found in rooms discussing things like marriage and all that because not many people want to hear that and yeah a friend was able to drag me into a room to come talk about marriage and everybody there was just like oh you know i'm gonna find the person i'm we're gonna stay married forever no divorce and all that's like uh this is why i don't come to this kind of place <laughs> yeah, been through life. Like, <laughs> I've seen people who were only married together for two years, three years, and they're not. Yeah. It, it, they didn't have to end up being hardcore enemies. Not like a Romeo Juliet right. that we all gotta die or stick. You know, right. it, it's not this ride or die mentality. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't want somebody like that in my life. You know, right. and for the first time I met uh, Verena, and when we decided to go seriously, I told her like, hey, if you ever feel you know this is not working out, yeah. It, it, feel free to we can call yeah. it quits it's not like we have to i don't i'm not bound by this right um school of thought and the more i look back and more information comes out from the past we find out how many people just were in it just because they had no choice to right. leave yeah. you know people i was a, a friend of mine once posted a meme of uh well, like, oh, bl black couples are in love and uh, look how they stay together like 50 years and all this. Look at us divorcing him now. I'm like, uh, have you ever talked to one of them grandparents and all that and discovered how it, divorce wasn't really an option on the table back right. then? 
And, and they couldn't have financially done it anyway. Yeah. So, and what the, 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 the burden is always on the woman. Right. So, exactly. If, you know, women had to consider so many things, and, you know, but the moment the, with more of, um, improvement in the financial status, mm-hmm. we've seen how, yeah, maybe people are like, I'm not going to be chained to this. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. And if I even look back in Nigeria as a kid reading newspapers, where by the time I was a teenager, in Nigerian newspapers, there were lots of divorces at the lowest yeah. courts. Ordinary people were getting divorced, and the reasons are similar to reasons that I see here. But for some reason, someone will come out and say, "No, divorce is like you know, it's, it's against God." And I'm like, "What? Yeah. What God? Which God? Which right. one?" And all yeah. that. So, yeah, that's why I'm, I I love that. Just because you're divorced, I mean, it's over. It doesn't mean at all. Yeah, that's no. A and pe- people need to hear stuff like that. And that's why another reason why I wanted to bring you on the podcast because I, I just love the way you, you handle something like that and both of you shout out to your ex he's uh yeah I'm, 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 I would love to meet someone like that because I, I love hearing seeing people like that because it doesn't mean you can't find happiness it doesn't right. mean your happiness is totally tied to one individual forever what about the kids yes yeah, happiness exactly. too from the kids and exactly all that. they didn't ask to be brought here yeah so yeah that, that's beautiful so and, and another thing is uh, I think you've given little clues about it when did you begin to embrace setting boundaries in your life oh that's a good question i think it's been a journey of figuring out what a boundary is probably from the time i got into college um Mm -hmm. learning first what boundaries were and learning about myself and my body and then you know consent and what i'm comfortable with because being an indian woman I wasn't taught to value my own opinion and to value what I wanted. I was taught to do the right thing, which is really, you know, whatever my parents say, and then, you know, I get married off and then it's whatever my mother-in-law says, or, you know, my husband would say. Mm -hmm. So I definitely think um, when I went to college and in my twenties is when I started to really learn my boundaries. But I think honestly, probably not until my thirties and I'm 34 now, not until my thirties did I become more comfortable in saying, these are my boundaries. This is who I am. Yeah. This is what I want. This is what I will not tolerate. And mm-hmm. it's it's still a challenge. And there's still times where I go back to those old things that I was taught and I'm like, oh, well, you know, I should really just accept that because it's the right thing to do. And then I have to say, no, no. I mean, do I, is this my boundary? Because if it's my boundary, then I need to honor that. Yeah. You're not um, wrong about that. Everything you said is on point because I, I'm, I'm going to be 40 next year and I, I, it was just a few years ago I started really setting boundaries. Although based on my actions, I can look back to I can look further back and see that there were times when I was like, "No, nah, no, nah, this, this, you won't cross this line with me. This yeah. is it. I'm, I'm done here." But still, the 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 terms uh, uh, saying setting boundaries. You no, know, I didn't. I, boundary didn't. Boundary was just something physical, like between countries. That was yeah. what yep. I grew up on. So yeah. not, it didn't even occur to me that it was something. Nobody used that as a language yeah. in my life that yeah. can apply to my living. So, yeah, it, yeah. it's something that I'm still learning as, as, me, as I go along yes. and I interact with people like you. It helps me see that, yes, I'm on the right path. And, yeah. Yes, so. self-love and self-respect. I'm definitely still learning what that means and all the ways that I have to really. It's like unlearning what I've what I've been taught. More than learning something new, it's unlearning all the old yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's on learning that's that's right because I, I i for me i say i'm rewiring my brain yes because yeah. I've, I've, i was already wired to be this way think exactly. this way you have control over the woman and no opinion and i'm like i don't really enjoy those type of i don't enjoy yeah. a relationship like that but that was something already fighting within me the, the cracks yeah. had started appearing long long time ago but i've refused to acknowledge or accept that there were cracks in whatever yeah. messaging i was you know because there were times when i'm like yeah i've met women who would literally do everything that I wanted them to do or say. And mm. yeah, I'm, I'm not Prince Akeem from uh, Coming yeah. to America. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like the way Prince Akeem ran away from that woman back in, yeah. that, that yeah. was me. I was like, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not attracted to such people. Yeah. But that was also setting a boundary for what I wanted in my love life. But I didn't yeah. realize I was doing that. I was just like, oh, maybe I'm very picky. Maybe, yeah. But yeah, being picky yeah. is part of setting your boundary. Right. Too. Yep. It's <laughs> you knowing de- yourself. Yeah, you know yourself. You deserve what what works for you and what works for yeah. your partner too. Because that, that's yeah, I was included. So um, I know we don't really have much time. 
to be with you. So let's uh, let's see. You also do content creating. How are you able to start that, or you know, put yourself out there, you know, and how do you deal with um, any negative feedback on doing that? Because for for women, I know it's a lot more different for, for, from men and for for black men and you know, and for women of color. So you know how people get extra when it comes to women of mm -hmm. color. How did I start getting into it? Is I really just started thinking about what mattered to me and what was my true passion that I was afraid to do or maybe ashamed of doing. And it's absolutely shame-free femininity and on the women's side. And then for couples, it's about intimacy and uh, sexual wellness and sensual wellness. So in the ways of like Tantra and Tao healing, mm -hmm. um, because we all are here because of sexual energy is what yes. created us and so for me the fact that we can't talk about that that we can't own it that it's so shielded is doesn't make sense i mean i come from india the land of the kama sutra and we don't learn it it's like you know some taboo thing so it all it all comes back to that for me i think for women also especially because we are sexualized we don't own our own sexuality so it's mm. important that we own that that doesn't mean we abuse it that doesn't mean it looks the same for me as it does for someone else but it does mean owning it, recognizing what it is, what I'm comfortable with. For some women, that's, you know, wearing the hijab and being covered. For some people, it's, you know, being very open and outwardly dressed, whatever it is. I really want women to identify that for themselves and own it for themselves. When it comes to the criticism, I meditate pretty consistently. I, I meditate in the morning, usually the afternoon and in the evening to really stay centered mm -hmm. and to stay connected to the source and to have the fuel that I need to do what I need to do. Um, the criticism I see as, as a sign that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, that there's some rebuttal against me because I'm walking in my passion. But I also, depending on what the criticism is, I'm not uh, unwilling to hear it. You know, criticism is just someone's thoughts, but that doesn't mean it has to be an offense to me. Yeah. Someone else can have their thought and I can still have mine, but we can learn from each other, which is very mature to me. So I try to embody that. If someone has something to say, if it's just straight toxicity and anger, I know that it's a problem with that person. It has nothing to do with me. But if there's That's something right. valid there, then mm -hmm. I'm always willing to hear it. I'm always willing to see what is that person saying and is there something I'm not aware of. So um, I'm not afraid of the criticism. It doesn't affect me negatively at all. I appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's the way to go. I'm like um, my favorite podcast, which I consider the, the best podcast in the world, that I will always give a shout out to is uh, The Black Guy Who Tips. So mm -hmm. husband and wife, I think you'll you love them if, if you if you get into that podcast, you love them all the way. And yeah, they've talked about stuff like that, and I took something from them. I'm like, yeah, if you have something negative to tell me, yeah, send it to me. I'll read it, and yeah, send it in private. I don't need that on my Apple yeah. ranking. Good, that's the only place I want to see positive reviews. Put yeah. positive stuff there. That's good. But if you got something negative, yeah, come talk to me. If you if you vaccinated, you can come talk to me one on one. Yeah. If you're not vaccinated, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I might even be like, yeah, yeah just yeah, 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 uh, you know, I'll forward it to someone else. So good uh -huh. things. Like I know some of vaccinated people say, so, hey, yeah, there you go, y'all, y'all get together <laughs> and do your thing, you know. But yeah, I, I, I don't need that. Um, I, I don't. Once upon a time, I was worried about oh people, what will people say, what will people do that about, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. it's them. It's on. It's there's something that they have to deal with. It's not for yeah. me to fix. So, if y'all just come with me with some negative energy, then uh, yeah, yeah I'll just divert it. You know, that's why I got vaccinated to be on the five G network and be away from such unnecessary drama. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, one last serious question before I jump into the wrap up side of things. Uh, What's one thing about how you were raised that you are sure not to repeat with your kids? And what's one thing from that you've kept from your upbringing that you use in your relationship with your kids? One thing that I do not repeat is conditional love. Mm. So for me growing up, love was based on Am I smart enough? Am I listening well enough? Am I well behaved? You know, it's like these check marks. And if I missed one of the check marks, then love was taken away. So I'm not that way with my kids at all. I 
love them all the time. I shower them with verbal praise and hugs and tell them that regardless of what they do, how they act, who they choose to be, I will always be here for them. I will always be a safe space. I will always be protective for them. I will always be that warm place. If they ever need to rest, I am here for them from now until eternity. They have me and they will always have me. I didn't have that. So I definitely want that for my kids. And then one thing that I keep that I was definitely taught is the hard work and the high ambitious goals. Mm -hmm. You know, we came here as immigrants and it was very, very high standards that I was held to and, and the way that I was pushed and kind of even encouraged and supported in that way. And I do that same thing for my kids. I expect really high standards of them intellectually, emotionally, you know, in their own spiritual self-discovery. I just expect so much of them but I support them along the way. You know, I try to love them along the way and guide them um, because I think that that added a lot of value in my life too. Awesome. And, you know, I, I never thought of, I don't think I, it, it's ever been broken down to me as conditional love. But when you were talking about that, yeah, I resonated with that because it's something that, uh, yeah, I, I think that was what love may yes. have been to me. And for a period of time, I that was how I also applied love in everything that I did, but I'm um, more on, this, um, on the side of, uh, yeah, I love my, my daughter. I love her. And that's one reason why I didn't even, um, you know, before she was born, there were people who are, who are no longer even in my life because the, the first thing they wanted to do was, oh, so you don't want to know the gender? You don't know, um, you, how, how, what, what would you do? How would you prepare? I'm like, what do you mean it's a baby? The baby is coming. Yeah. Like, well, we love the baby. And if Verena wants to know, then yeah, we, we, we will know. But I was fine with not knowing until the mm -hmm. day she arrived. And when she arrived and she came out and I held her in my hands, that, that there's a certain love that just, you know, activated. I was like, oh man, this guy's not yeah. a samurai as he once thought he was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I sure he got my heart, but I, I yeah. held her. I was like, if that had been a boy, same thing would have happened. Yeah. The same yeah. love would have been there. So. Uh, yeah, it, it's not about conditional love, and um, yeah, but when people always try to bring that stuff, oh, you know, so she's gonna play for Nigeria, or she, yeah, she's she gonna play for Germany because her mom is from Germany. And I'm like, I don't know if she wants to do soccer what does she or not. Do? <laughs> if she likes it, fine. If she doesn't, well, you know, she has interest, she do her own thing. The only yeah. thing she's not allowed to do is she can't be a DC Comics fan. I'm a Marvel guy. We're gonna, we're gonna, get, get out of the house. Get out. Get out. I disown you. That kind of thing. <laughs> Gotta draw the line somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's the line. I understand. I understand. I respect it. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. But um, yeah, I don't have a DC Comics uh, encyclopedia at home. And she knows <sighs> one or two characters already. I don't watch any DC property because I don't consider them worthy of my time. But I still <laughs> introduce her but to you it. Give her I give her options. She's going to have options. And I'm not religious. Her mom's not religious. I don't believe in any religion, to be honest. But I have books on different religions. And Good. if she decides she wants her. to go that route, she might yeah. need somebody to manage the money for the church she creates. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always available. I volunteer my time <laughs> for that, too. You know? <laughs> uh, so... Let's wrap it up with two questions that will be, yeah, well, I'm hoping to get at least one controversial answer from one of them and people might come after you based on what you say. So let's start let's with go. food. I already got an inkling to something about your food interests, but like, give us a taste of uh, what, what's your favorite cuisine and where is it from? Indian, without a doubt. Indian food tops everything the oh. number of spices no. the curry the color the eclectic variety of vegetables and vegetarian options oh goodness ah oh, there is nothing like a delicious indian meal cooked by my amachi or by my mother i mean it, first of all it's better than any restaurant but indian food compared to anything else mm, nope no comparison so, they can come for me. Uh, um, Amachi is your grandma? Amachi is grandma, yeah. Grandma, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I never heard anyone use that. It's, it's it, it sounds similar to Amarachi, which is a name from the Igbo, southeastern part of Nigeria. Um, <sighs> okay. So that's my, 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 I'm trying to, my brain, there's a fight going on there now. Like, it's, it's not Amarachi, <laughs> it's Amachi. So, you said Indian food. No, I was like, man, she didn't say Pakistan. So I can get some, some controversial people writing like, no, no, <laughs> complain. 
or Bangladeshis. But uh, y'all can still write in. I'll, I'll point you to Presieta. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll hook you all up. Go after her. <laughs> but um, so your Amachis, our mom's food, Indian food. But India is a subcontinent. So what part of India are you loyal to? We're going to get some controversy. Yeah, so we got we got, we got to put you on the spot. So, South Indian. South I'm, Indian. My family is from the state of Kerala, so God's country, the land of coconut trees. Ah. Well, I have no idea how much coconut oil we produce, but I'm pretty sure it's a lot. I mean, it's literally just dotted with coconut trees. It's like every tree is a coconut tree. Every tree is pretty much a, a fruit-bearing tree, so jackfruit everywhere, mango, cashew, just Beautiful, 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 beautiful food. Beautiful country and color. It's just Kerala. Kerala, Kerala food. Our breakfast is amazing. I mean, it's like the variety that we have of breakfast type of like doughy material. Like um, we have doshas. We just have chapati. There's just so many ways that we take flour, mm -hmm. like, you know, rice flour or wheat flour and make it into something. Idli and sambar, kappa. There's just so many options so on the spot now which one is your go-to which one is like mm, if we want to get Priscilla to sing but just be happy just to be on our to be our bffs what is the <laughs> cuisine that was the food that we had to place in front of you and which you, you'll be like oh i love you for life some something so simple and home for me is upma it's like it's like um grains that are kind of stir fried and they're cooked with some spices like mustard seeds and mm. some of our curry leaves. Okay. And I like to eat it with banana. So it's like, oh. you know, kind of grains, but then you get it with a banana. It's soft. I just love it. It's like a very common food there. You know, it's like, it's probably like a bowl of cereal here. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like that, that, so it, simple. Yeah, it sounds a lot like cereal. Yeah, yeah, but it's to me, it like, it reminds me of like just Saturday morning at home. My mom is making upma with a little bit of banana and that was just that just brings me home oh yeah that that that, that also brought me home too I mean, <laughs> i've never tasted it but it's like yeah that's something i can definitely get down with but about kerala food that you you, you all have to invite me to come do a full tryout <laughs> and then we can come to a proper assessment of uh, <laughs> the food but uh, everything you've said makes it sound I, I don't doubt anything you said i think yeah, you. Yeah, we go. We go with you. I. I. I think you. You. Yeah, you count. You count. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm. I'm right on this one. I know I am. All right. So now the next question, and I know from what I've seen and heard from you, you definitely dance. You there's some dancing in your life, and now we need to know. One hour is gonna be too little, but we're just gonna have to stick with one hour. We need to keep you dancing for one hour. Give us three artists. You can make it four, but three artists that you like. Okay, I gotta go to this for my dancing. And you can't give us the most popular names. You know, you gotta give if if you got artists from Kerala, then oh, even better that you get more points for that too. Okay. So. Well, my one from Kerala is Vidya Vox. She I really like. So she mixes um, like fusion. So she mixes Indian beats and American okay. beats. And it's really nice. It's really, really nice. It's How, a beautiful What's the name again? Vidya Vox. Vidya Fox. Oh, okay. Vox with a V. Vox. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So I like I like her music a lot. Um, but if I if I have to pick to dance here in the US, I'm definitely gonna start with Mulatto because I love female rappers. It's, yeah, I've heard just, that name. I don't know if I've listened to her. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm really a big fan of Mulatto. She, you know, she speaks to my heart. She speaks to my heart in the most powerful, feminine, bossy way possible. Where so is I she really, from? Really... Mulatto, I think she's from somewhere down south. Okay. I don't know where she's from, but she, I mean, so she's you, American. You, 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 you're staying with your southern roots, okay. Yes, yes, always no, a no, southern no, root. No, no, all, no controversy all. there. All right, <laughs> all right. Always, always southern roots. And then my third person who I'm going to stick with is also going to be a woman. Now, this one's more common, but it's it's got to be Cardi B. I just really like Cardi B. Oh, hard, I, hard. I, when you, yeah, 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 that's that's my, my home girl. Well, you, you, you chose me someone from New York. All right, we ain't going to. Okay, so that makes you happy. We're we, good. We, we can't. We can't. 
I, I can't send people after you now. That's not okay. fair. Okay. Okay. All fair. right. All right. I have okay, to be I'm glad it worked now. out. <laughs> <laughs> see, there was a, see I'm, I'm fair. There are all three women, but one of the three is from the North. <laughs> no, there's some controversy still. There's something controversial in your choices. <laughs> you live in Oklahoma City, down south. It's Oklahoma, Oklahoma is south, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's considered south. So uh, there's not one country artist here. No. No, no country no. music? No. No. Oh, yeah. Right. You guys can write in now. Country people. <laughs> write in and come after. You know who to come yeah. after now. You, you, come oh, after me. No, there's no I'm love for country country. music. All no them heartbreak no songs country. and all them sad songs there. No. None. Oh, mm -hmm. man. I mean, uh, people still dance to those, but I'm like, man, that's, a, that's some depressing music they got. I mean, they got some lively music too, but they got too many. <laughs> Their stories yeah. are like, I'm like, these are crazy white people <laughs> stories. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I, I don't know if um, they used to do this in India, but in Nigeria, um, well, in the cities that I lived in, before, um, I think Sundays and around Christmas time used to be like, Country music, just they just beat you with country music. Yes, I grew up to love country music. <laughs> oh my gosh, no. I don't know if they still do it now, but yeah, lots of country music. People around my age, yeah, like I interviewed someone who I knew from back in Nigeria before he came here. He came here before me, and yeah, he was like, Oh, yeah, country music, man. He still loves country. Music. I was like, Ah, oh, man, hmm. he, he, he hasn't been, he, he never broke free of that. The, the hold is strong, nope. like, yep. I, I got lucky, I wasn't put through that so i'm sorry for you unless you <laughs> like it too but yeah, no, i, mean, I, I like dixie Oklahoma, chicks uh, and, i mean there's a couple and, 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 there's like one yeah. dixie chick song i like and uh what else? strawberry I, wine i like that I, I one of my problematic songs is the uh beer for my horses whiskey for the men i don't know why it's just um i, I can't des describe that so I, but there's something that every time i hear this song i just sing it and <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's it resonates with your spirit. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but I started from a funny place of laughing at the song, and then I started singing it. So. And the, uh, that's you that's how they get you. With you. That's how they get you. That is how they get you. <laughs> they make you laugh, and then all of a sudden you like. <laughs> so I've had so much fun having you here. I really appreciate you giving me your time and coming Likewise. on the podcast today. So final question, what would you like to leave the audience with? You know, your freestyle moment, drop some extra gems to the gems you've already given us. I would like to leave your audience with the choice to figure out what they love, not what they were told to love, not what they were told to be, but really who are they on the inside? What is that weird part of themselves that they cannot get rid of that keeps coming back maybe it's some type of dance maybe it's a form of art media or maybe it's public speaking or maybe it's encouraging others or some really outrageous spiritual belief whatever it is there's something in each of us that is very unique to us and we're all put on this earth to find it to uncover it and to bring it to life because the more we do that the more we encourage other people to do that and we just become who we're intended to be rather than just being robots you know we're humans we we follow what's on the inside of us rather than just responding to our environments like animals just having kind of biological reactions and chemical reactions we have the ability to create we have the ability to manifest to do so much but it's really when we tap into the power within that we can manifest the most beautiful things so i would say to your audience Find that power within, find whatever that unique calling is that's individualistic to them and birth it, bring it to life. Yeah, I'm, I'm already beginning to find my power within. I was like, you know, and I knew it was going to drop something extra beautiful. <laughs> so, hey, um, I, I, I forgot how to say thank you in Hindi. So, yeah, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go with a different language. Barang. I, I pick languages from almost all my guests. And I know multiple thank yous. So there's some simple ones like Barang, which is from the Gambia, the Manjaco tribe. Uh, okay. my, my people is Umbana. Okay. So, yeah, Barang for coming on the podcast. And, uh, yeah, please plug yourself and uh, give, give, how can people find you or, you know, find your content? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram at miss.proceda. So it's spelled like preset, P-R-E-S-E-T-A with an 
A at the end, so preset A, but pronounced Presita, like you see me. So you can find me there. That's probably the easiest way to get me. Awesome. And I'll be adding that to the show notes. And you all go follow Miss Presita on Instagram, get some great knowledge and gems, and you find that power within. You will, you will if you follow her. You know, except if you have some blockage that you need to take care of, then yeah, that, that, that's. Uh, I'll help yeah. you with that too. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah. find ways to release will, the yeah, blockages. We'll, we'll, okay, yeah, and I, I still I know some other people too. Like in case <laughs> they need extra help, then I send them some <laughs> therapists that I know. But, hey, thank you again. Extra love to you. Um, keep up the great work that you're doing. Keep inspiring. Keep being extra awesome, and I just love that energy that comes from you. It's it's beautiful to see and hear. And thank you yeah we'll definitely have to bring you back again for something we'll cook up later on yeah it's been wonderful thank you for having me thank you for having me for everything you do you serve a huge community of people so power to you power my pleasure to you. my pleasure and to everyone listening keep the love coming in don't forget to give us five stars go on our apple do that and um, you can get t-shirts and yeah spread it the word around to your family loved ones and everybody I'll see you next week. Thank you for the privilege of your company. Thanks for listening to White Label American. If you enjoy the show, we'll appreciate if you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. If you have any questions, comments, or have someone who will be a good guest on the show, or you want to be on the show, send us a message at whitelabelamerican at gmail.com and make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at White Label American. Thank you for your support.